You're listening to WUSB Stony Brook, 90.1 FM and 107.3 FM. And if you're lucky, you get to be watching us for this one. And we have a very special guest on today's last DJ show, rock and roll royalty on Long Island, member of the Long Island Music Hall of Fame, a recipient of the Shirley Strum Kenny Student Arts Award, um, in 2021, and a man who, with his band Zebra, headlined the opening of the Long Island Music and Entertainment Hall of Fame last year. Please welcome with me Randy Jackson, the front man, singer, guitarist, and songwriter of Zebra. Thank you for joining me, Randy. Thanks for having me, Rob. Um, a lot to, uh, to go over. It, this, this interview has been 40 years in the making since I popped Zebra's cassette into my 65 Chevy Impala SS convertible. And I'm a little nervous, I uh, must admit. So bear with me on this. I guess the best place to start is the most, uh, the most pressing news with Zebra, your Thanksgiving Eve show at the Paramount. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to be there on Thanksgiving Eve. It's always been a great night of the year for uh, Long Island, you know, for rock and roll and people going out. So we're hoping... Uh, It'll it'll work again this year. Okay. Now, last year you you sold out two shows on Thanksgiving Eve. Not on thanks. Well, it was around uh, the time. Yeah, right, I don't know. Right. Yeah, but we sold out two shows. Yeah. Okay. And then you spent most of 2023 uh, going on the 40th anniversary tour for the first album. Yeah, and we've been doing it all over the country. It's been going well. It's amazing that people, you know, after after all this time, are still coming out and enjoying the music. So. Uh, I was lucky enough to see the show you guys did at the space, and it's. Uh, I had forgotten how great that album was, front to back, and also how listening to an album in its entirety has kind of become a lost art in the digital age. Yeah, um, you know, when, when when I was a kid, you know, the whole album was part of the experience, and. Uh, and you, kind of, and you do kind of forget that these days, you know. Before I get into the next question, I have to ask you, I, I imagine you've heard the new Beatles song they put out last week. Yes. What, what did you think of that just briefly off the top of your head? I mean, I thought that uh, it was great that they put it out. Um, I, I thought that out of the three songs that they released, because it was, I guess it was part of the, uh, going to be part of the anthology, uh, the other two I, th I like better as songs, uh, but it was nice to hear it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know, I, what was that, 20 years ago, 1995, that they put the anthology out? That's 30, almost 30 years ago. So uh, that was, I think it was good that they finished it up. Okay. It's kind of a nice thing. Uh, the reason I asked this question is we've been talking to a lot of people about the Beatles song, and uh, most people uh, kind of had somewhat negative reaction to it. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that as artists age, their audience doesn't let them age as easily as Father Time ages them. Yeah. So you, the, any song becomes a product of the song, the artist, and the audience all being in the same place at the same time. You're kind of a perfect guy to ask this next question to, because mm -hmm. when you guys first started, according to Wikipedia, it was 1975. Yes. Your first album came out in 1983. A lot happened between 75 and 83. Yeah. I, when, you know, when you got together, you had Zeppelin was flying, Pink Floyd, The Who. By the time your first album came out, we had lost Bonham, Keith Moon, and I don't know if you knew this, but the very day Zebra came out, the final cut came out, the last Pink Floyd album. Wow. And at that point in time, uh, you know, it was the MTV age. So my question to you is, how has the way you approach, uh, you know, songwriting and the things that influence your songwriting, how has that changed between 75 and 83 and even today? Um, I, I don't think my approach is much different. Uh, you know, I've always, 
thought the music and the melody uh, were the most important things for me. I, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd listen to uh, songs and I, I didn't really care what the words were. If, it, if, it, if the music hooked me, I would like the song. Um, the lyrics came second. Not that they're not, not, not important, but you got to have something to draw people in, and it's usually going to be the music. So, um, And my approach to songwriting, I don't think it's really changed much. Um, uh, you know, I'm not like, I won't sit down and just write a whole song, usually. I've done that like once or twice, but uh, usually I, it's like a, a process of, of writing parts and, and it, whatever comes to me. I, I don't try to force it, so I'll, and I want it to be, you know, fun. So I'm not going to sit there and just, uh, just grind something and keep at it. Um, I'll put it aside, go to something else, you know, and just keep, keep just writing stuff, put pieces, and then when I have a what I think is a, enough for a record, I'll go back and then I'll take all the pieces off the floor and put them together, you know, and then. From, from maybe me scatting around or whatever I was saying may come some lyrics or I might have some ideas, but uh, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long process as far as my songwriting goes. And I don't think it's really changed any. Maybe what I'm writing about might have changed because of the age, but, uh, but not much else, yeah. Is it different writing to older audiences or do you not consider uh, you know, what place the listener might be in at the time? No, I think I'm writing for, you know, audience my age. Um, I'm not looking at writing for younger people because I think, you know, I, I, even though there are younger people that will listen to the band, that the songs I wrote back when I was young are the ones that they can maybe more relate to, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm writing to my audience, so, you know, that's... My age. That's why, you know, when you get back to the Beatles song, you know, that's a song that was written in the 70s. I mean, think about that. You know, John Lennon wrote that. That may not, not even have made it on, onto a record because he did. A, he had just tons of stuff. Uh, you know, we worked with Jack Douglas, and Jack Douglas had played me uh, the cassettes of uh, cassettes he had of, of uh, Real Love and, um, you know, and those songs. And I remember... You know, he said, yeah, John would just pump them out, you know. he Did yeah. he produce Double Fantasy? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he did. That was one of, part of the reason that we uh, we got him. You know, he was at the top of our list of producers because I just thought that record sounded so amazing. And, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it would be like, you know, I, I mean, I when I write, I, I write, I'll write like, you know, 30, 40 songs and then have Guy and Felix pick what they think they like. And we'll, you know, we'll do those songs. So just taking a song, you know, and somebody redoing it, you know, I mean, it's a nice thing, but, you know, who knows whether Lennon would have even wanted that, uh, you know, to be the song, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, I, the, looking back at the way that came to be, it was essentially a throwaway Kinda, the, yeah, at the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, the first time I listened to it, I was expecting some things to happen that, you know, I'm I'm rewriting the song as I'm listening, you know, and I'm going, major chord, not minor there, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it was, it was it was pretty interesting, you know? Now, were the Beatles the band that made you want to do this for a living, or were they? Yeah, yeah. You know? That was, the, the Beatles were it. Uh, you know, I got the first 45 brought to me by a friend uh, from down the street. Her name was Linda Rosenbaum, and it was, uh, she said, you got to listen to this. I think I was like, eight years old at the time and uh i put it on the turntable and all i'd really listened to that was in that kind of genre at all was les paul and mary ford um and so but this was different way different and uh you know i got hooked on it my parents took my brother and me to see the beatles in 1964 down in new orleans and uh and, and what, what you saw in Ed Sullivan was what was happening at this live show. So it was all for real. And I said, this looks like a lot of fun, you know. It must have been life-changing to be a little kid and have the Beatles dropped into your world. Yeah, well, it, it was. And the, the funny part about it when I look back is that, you, you know, as a kid, you think this is normal. Okay, well, this is a band. I'm young. This is a normal thing. 
Yeah, you put out three, four albums a year. <laughs> You know, with ten great <laughs> hits on each one. Yeah. <laughs> Little do you know, you're 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 seeing the evolution of something that. Uh well, it happened once in a lifetime, you know? I, I always love the little bonus singles, like Let It Be. Oh, yeah, we, we're making too much great music to put on an album, so right. we had to just release a little single a, here. A great double A side. Right. Um, really, such a flash in time. Um, and you did an album of Beatles songs. Yeah, I did. Um, you know, I was playing solo acoustic shows for many years, and. Uh, had a friend of mine who's a big Beatles fan, Rick Muser, who's passed now. God bless him. And uh, he uh, he wanted. He said, you know, I got this record label that uh, they'd be interested in putting a, a collection of Beatles songs for you to do. And I said, that sounds interesting. So I did do that. Yeah. That album doesn't get enough recognition, in my opinion. And there's. One of the cool things about YouTube in the digital age is uh, I feel like I'm still discovering music, you know, even from the 60s, sure. deep cuts and B-sides of the Stones and the Who that you're like, Never know. how did I not hear of this? But a lot of us were victims of uh, FM radio. Yeah. So I'll use that as the segue to the next section. Mm -hmm. um, has... That transformation from the way classic rock radio used to be to the way iTunes and the streaming ages, has that changed your approach at all? You know, where you can write a song or two songs and not have to think conceptually in the form of an album? Mm, it hasn't changed it for me. I mean, I think that if I was younger, I, I might have a different point of view, but... Uh, for me, the song need, needs to be good enough to last. Uh, I mean, we, when Zebra started out, you know, we, we were doing originals, but we were doing a lot of covers. But uh, we, I would always want to do songs that I envisioned being able to play 10 years from then, you know, uh, that, that weren't going to just go away. You know, we weren't like a top 40 band, you know, and, and there were so many bands that would pl learn songs and then... You know that they play them for a couple of months, and then now they got to learn another song because it's coming up the charts. And uh, and I, I, I guess we were pretty good at picking songs to play that uh, were going to last because it it worked out, and maybe it rubbed off on the songwriting too. You know. Um, the as a fan looking at your catalog, the content you were writing about, you put it in a position to age better, um, like. To use Led Zeppelin as an example, not that that music hasn't aged, but when John Bonham died, Robert Plant very quickly kind of tried to put that behind him. And as he got older and as we all got older, I realized why that, you know, he was a dad and a grandfather. And if you look at what every Zeppelin song was about, it's hard to get out there and sing the lemon song when your grandkids are in the audience. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, Where, yeah. you know, pretty much the whole first Zebra album, you can go out there and lyrically and musically the songs hold up. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, if you look back at Led Zeppelin uh, in particular, I mean, a lot of what they did, they, they were just like, they got together and they just were working and grabbing anything they could to make songs. And uh, and a lot of what Robert Plant did in the very beginning was just take some of the old blues song lyrics and, you know, twist them a little bit to make them his own. But, uh, it, you know, it wasn't really his lyric. So it wasn't what he wanted to sing about, a whole lot of love, none, you know, what he what he liked singing would come out later, you know, you'd hear, or his lyrics, you know, you'd hear it in uh, stuff like the Rain Song. and uh, But the early stuff was all raw sex, you know. And, uh, you know, that that never crossed, it never crossed my mind to do anything like that, you know, back, back then. I mean, we played those songs, you know, or songs like them. But, uh, yeah, I wanted the stuff to, to kind of last and be a little more mature. Cause I was really... Lyrically more influenced by the Moody Blues than I was, you know, by uh, by any 
anybody else. You know, even the Beatles were writing about, you know, she loves you and, you know, that stuff, yeah. which was great, but, you know. Moody Blues are very uh, and underappreciated, I think. Yeah. Uh, they got their, I, they were big here, but you don't often hear them when people start talking about the bands like we were just talking about, Zeppelin and The Who. Yeah. It doesn't come up. Yeah. Um, I like to talk about the first album a little bit and how that came to be and what you were uh, kind of pulling together a lot of the things you described so far in this interview. Uh, they say you have your whole life to write your first album and 10 months to write your second album. Yeah. So how can you take us through a little bit the development of the songs that would end up on Zebra? The first album. First album. It was, you know... From, from the day we went out uh, in 1975, my intention was to try to get a record deal. And we had a lot of songs already, and we would play them. We wouldn't, like, announce, this is our song, you know, we would just play them. And, uh, and you got honest feedback from that. You know, if somebody said, well, you know, what was that song with the last, it said the last time, you know? And... It, they tell you whether they liked it or not, or whatever they wanted were saying. And so, the fans really kind of molded the first album. You know, they they were the ones that, you know, guided us to what we should be doing. And so it wasn't a hard thing to put together. Uh, we slow down, which was the uh, one cover that we did, uh, was just from a drunk fest at a Mexican <laughs> restaurant. You know, and in the middle of doing the sessions and we got back to the studio and recorded it and it ended up being on the record because it was fun and uh you know but as far as the re rest of the record the you know it was really a, a result of what the fan the feedback from the fans and like you said the second record you know you don't have much time to do it and i wish i would have like really taken that more seriously because when we went out on the road i was we were I was partying. That's all I could say. We were going from town to town, having a great time, and you know, opening up for Lover Boy and Cheap Trick and uh, Wario Speedwagon, and we were just, you know, enjoying it. It was different. We'd spent eight years in the in the nightclubs in New York and New Orleans, and you know, this was a little bit of a different thing. But uh, but we had a good time, and then sure, we get off the road, and then oh right, we got to do another album. I mean, fortunately. You know, I had a lot of material that we hadn't used and that I hadn't even really, some of it I hadn't even looked at. And uh, we had enough to make the second record, but when we went on the road for the second record, I completely stopped all the party and, and I was writing. So I wrote every day on the road to, to, to write the third album. So at least I knew I could do that. You know, even when we finished the third album, I said, good, the album's good. I, I can do this, you know, I can put at least put this much out every time, you know. There's a lot of good stuff on the second album, too. It's kind of fallen through the cracks for some reason, but uh, Lullaby and Bears especially, that's one of my favorite, uh, yeah. uh, you know, timeless lyrics. But even as a song, the things you talked about, the, the melody, great solo in that song. Thanks. And... Uh, which I can say about many of your songs. <laughs> You're a fantastic guitar player. And uh, before I keep going, before I lose a train of thought, do you still have all those old BC riches that you used to play back in the day? I have the white ones, yeah. The, those are the ones you're probably talking about. I, I had a couple before then that got stolen in Houston before we ever got a record deal, but the white ones that you're talking about uh, were the ones that replaced the stolen ones, and they were... The, they were actually a matched pair, and they were made at the same time, and they were painted in the same session by BC Rich. So, it's kind of unique. It's uh, I'm kind of a, I'm a big guitar fan, and the first guitar I ever had was a BC Rich, was and it? it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, they have a very unique history as far as guitar makers go, where you know the vintage stuff is highly sought after, and then Ed Roman kind of passed away and they kind of just fell off the radar and people forget about the old BC riches they're so you know they reek of the 80s first of all yeah. you know when you see any metal video and I'm, I'm always thinking 
man, the time is so ripe for people to start bringing those old BC riches out of storage. Yeah. And yeah. when I see your old videos, a lot of times you're playing on them. I'm like, yeah. man, that's such a... Uh, th those guitars mark that space and time as much as anything. Yeah. They were, uh, you know, the first time I saw BC Rich, I was looking for a guitar to uh, replace a Les Paul that had gotten damaged. And uh, I went with uh, a friend of mine, Mark Hitt, who was a guitarist from a band called Rat Race Choir at the time. And we went to uh, Grayson's, I think it was, Grayson's Music Store in Hempstead. And they had a BC Rich uh, uh, Mockingbird Supreme in there. And I played it, and it just sounded phenomenal. And uh, you know, I, to this day, I wish I still wish I had that guitar. It just it was magic. Uh, but that was the one that got stolen. And and it was fun. It's funny because when I got the <clears throat> the other guitars, the BC Rich, you know, these this was for the world. It was kind of a new company, even though they had been making acoustic guitars, you know, for years and years. They started making the electrics right around that time. And uh, so when I did, I did a interview with Guitar Player Magazine, and of course they want the, to sensationalize whatever quote they can call from me, you know, and, and so the headline read, uh, Randy Jackson says, vintage guitars are bunk. Because I guess what I had said was, the BC Rich is just as good as, you know, these old, you know, guitars, and, you know, if you want to pay that much for them, go ahead, you know. But it's funny now that we're talking about the VC Rich is the vintage guitar, you know. It, it all happens eventually, you know. It's cool how those guitars even became vintage, because back in 1975, a 1970 Strat was just a guitar. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then you blink and it's 30 years down the road and you know, everyone's looking for the old Fenders and the old Gibsons. And then yeah. and you read stories of clapped in buying four of them for five hundred dollars total and building blackie and giving one to george harrison and joe yeah. walsh and they were all they all had money <laughs> even though five hundred dollars even you back know. in the day <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you hear those stories yeah. and uh it's we're in a very different world now um i know you have a deal with michael kelly right now yes is that is that all you play yeah, that's yeah, all I'm playing right now. I mean, the the uh, the vice president of the company, Steve Pizzani, is a longtime friend of mine, and uh, and the the reason I'm working is because uh, they're letting me design the guitars. I mean, completely. And uh, so, what better way to do it, you know, than with a good friend and uh, and being able to pretty much do what I want to do with the guitar? Are you working on electrics and acoustics? Yeah, uh, we got an electric. We've been working on the electric for. Uh, three or four years now, you know, it takes taking a long time, but uh, uh, we're getting we're getting pretty close right now uh, to uh, to the electric, and I think we're going to do a double neck too. Can you tell me what your ideal Randy Jackson guitar would would be like? Well, I'll I'll tell you this much without revealing the whole thing. <laughs> uh, it's going to be light. It's going to be a lighter guitar. I'm playing a prototype of it right now, and um, and it doesn't, you know, it's e I could play it all night and not go my neck, you know, it's hurt my shoulder or anything, and um, and it, but still want have the 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 big beefy sound, you know, and I think we've succeeded in doing that. Um, I also wanted to have a, uh, you know, a lot of these guitars have uh, an acoustic pickup on it, you know, an extra. Uh, feature on these things and but I've never really liked the tone and so we're we're really attacking that to make it more like a real acoustic guitar to the sound anyway you know and um, you know I think uh, yeah I, they should it should be out pretty soon I'm gonna say next year you get a fantastic sound out of your acoustics and uh, I especially appreciate the 12 string sound it's just a jangle that goes right through you as it should. Yeah. And nice. uh and I appreciate that you've always appreciated the acoustic guitar cuz a lot of uh, a lot of people do but not everyone does and it was it's always great to see when people like Jimmy Page would throw acoustic guitars and you could see 
what an acoustic can do even in the hands of the guitar gods. And it kind of, it's important because so much um, great music comes from acoustics and to bring it back to your Beatles album. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, most, I think most of the songs I've ever written, I've ri ri written on an acoustic guitar. So um, any song can really lend itself to it as far as my songs go. Um, it, you know, they, it's, it's easier to make a melody up and stuff. And, and plus you just pick it up and you play it, you know, uh, you still, you still have to do something with an electric guitar, whether it's put a battery in, if it's got a speaker on it or whatever. And, uh, you know, you I, I've always figured that stuff out later, you know, acoustics really the way to go, pick it up, press record and start, you know, writing. Um, now we can't do an interview like this and not mention Felix and Guy. No. Um, it's it's incredible that you guys have been uh, intact your whole career. It's um, you can't say that about too many rock bands. No, we're 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 a, one of a handful of bands that have been together this long. It'll be fifty years in uh, you know ne in two years nineteen. 2025 and we're all we've played every single year you know as zebra and um the only time we had any bump in the road was 1997 when guy had got breast cancer but even then he played some that year and we had uh, some great replacements for him that uh that worked out but um yeah you know the fact that we're even all still alive at this point are, are beating the odds i think you know even with just three of us um, so, double-sided question here. How did you three come together in the first place? And how do you, you know, people compare being in a band to being in a marriage, and there's a lot to be said about that. How have you guys managed to stay together for almost 50 years? Um, you know, as far as staying together, I think after the first five, six years together, we kind of knew what we could expect out of each other and there weren't any high expectations so like you said in a marriage you know you, you see people get married and they'll, they'll say oh you know she'll change or he'll change after we get married you know I, can, I know I can do this no you can't go into it thinking that you know you you you're marrying what you who who the person is and don't expect any change otherwise you shouldn't be really getting married um and that's kind of what we did. You know, we knew uh, what each of our limitations were and, you know, and, and, and then the uh, whatever we had that was uh, we were going to be contributing, you know. Um, and after that first five years, we were kind of through that period. And so we knew. And, and another thing is, is that the fans and us being fans, too, of, of music and bands, I think we, we realized that, you know, Fans don't want to see their bands breaking up and reforming with other people and stuff like that. They, you know, you want to even if even if you think you could, you know, these other musicians could do it better. They love the nostalgia. It's like being at home. So, you know, I think that's helped us a lot. Plus, um, we're pretty much politically on the same page. You know, <laughs> which really helps. You know, I see a lot of bands that are whether they're together or not together, they'll break up over politics, which is kind of insane when you think in the music world, but it happens. Well, the last 10 years, politics has made everything a lot harder, yeah. I think. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, musically, do Guy and Felix come from the same place, uh, have the same musical taste that you have, or do they bring different, uh, you know, likes into the soup that yeah. ultimately becomes Zebra? Well, before Zebra, uh, I was in a band that, well, I was in Felix's band. Felix had put a band together in 1973. Uh, they needed a guitar player, and, and his band, he had written this, all the songs for, for it, him and, uh, and his partner, Eldridge. And, you know, we played those songs, and that was kind of my reintroduction to songwriting, because the only songs I had ever written I wrote when I was like nine years old because I couldn't play a Beatles song. So I said, well, I'll write my own. I'll, I'll, I'll play that. And then I just stopped and kind of woodshedded all the, 
the bands that were coming out in the, in the uh, 60s, late 60s. And, um, and so when I met Felix, he was writing kind of more 60s pop, let's say. Not anything that I would I would write, but they were they were good songs, you know. And I and I put my uh, guitar stuff, you know, on them and made them a little heavier than they were. Uh, but Felix comes from kind of that, you know, that realm, the '60s pop. And but he 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 likes he liked what we where we were going. Um, the when when the the Shepherd's Bush, which was the band Felix's band, when they when we broke up. Uh, he was kind of, he was not in a good headspace, you know. And uh, but he, I was, I had, I had met Guy at that point, and Guy had come from Sacramento, California, and he had chased a girl to New Orleans because she, had, they, they, they had gotten together out there, and she left him. They broke up, and she, and somebody told him she went to Mardi Gras. Well. He he came down the stalker guy gal so stalked her out. You have a country and, song there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and he uh, he found her at Mardi Gras, and they uh, you know they got together for a little while, but uh, but guy decided he wanted to stay in New Orleans, and that's what he did. So uh, I met him through uh, a guy that was a manager at a couple of nightclubs, uh, one of them that I actually worked at, and guy. Uh, and I started playing together, and we were about doing, uh, you know, yes, some more progressive kind of stuff. And we got a keyboard player. We added a keyboard player, but we needed a bass player. And uh, and we got and so I went and I talked to Felix. I said, man, you could play the bass guitar, right? And uh, he was like, uh, you know, he did. <laughs> he wasn't really into talking about it, but I. You know, I said, you know, because we owed his brother some money. Felix's brother had loaned loaned us some money to get some equipment. And I said, look, you know, we can go out and play some covers, pay your brother back. How's that sound? And uh, so he, he agreed to do it. And we got together with the uh, uh, with the four of us. And we had, that was in 1974 and early 74. And we got some gigs playing some dances. And it was good. Uh, but... But the, the the kids wanted to hear dance music, and we were doing a lot of this progressive stuff you couldn't really dance to. So we started learning some danceable music, and at that time for us it was going to be uh, Bowie or uh, you know something rocking, but more, a little more out of the realm of what we were uh, we are initially wanted to do. And the keyboard player really wasn't into it, and he said. I'm not. I'm not doing this. You know, he, he, one really funny, funny story is that we were playing at a dance and we were playing uh, Suffragette City. And but something doesn't sound right to me. You know, it's 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 off. And I'm looking around, and <laughs> the keyboard players playing, and, I'll, and then I can I realize it's it's the keyboards. And he, I'm, I'm thinking maybe he doesn't know what we're playing, you know, but I know he's got a good ear. He couldn't be playing. We were halfway through the song, and I walk over to him, and he goes, I said, uh, Suffragette City. And he, he looks at me, and he mouths uh, Aqualung, you know. And, <laughs> and then he had a, he had a capped tooth that the, the glue had come off, and he, would, he could suck it off. <laughs> And he, did, and he did that and gave me the big grin with the hole in his tooth, and I just laughed. But that was kind of, that was kind of the end of the uh, the Maelstrom, is what it was called, the band. And and uh, we formed, you know, we reformed as a three piece. We looked for a singer for a little while, because uh, we, we, we that was what the idea originally was to have the three of us and a singer. But we couldn't find one for one reason or another. They either. They didn't want to sing with us, or, or they we didn't feel they were good enough. So we ended up just sharing the singing duties when we started. Uh, Felix had been the lead singer in the previous band we were in, and Guy had a great voice, you know. So uh, we played a variety of material, like 60 different bands, songs from uh, when I, I we went through the list. I think last year of all the different bands we played, and it was a lot. And Guy would sing uh, stuff like Deep Purple. He had a big husky voice, you know, to do that kind of thing. Um, and Felix did 
the Aerosmith and uh, some of the Bowie, and uh, and we all shared doing Led Zeppelin. You know, depending on what song it was, and uh, and then o over time, I just because I was doing the high high voice in my falsetta, and I didn't I didn't care that it was falsetta. They I, I just ended up doing more of that. You know. How did you find the transition to being a lead singer in a three-piece, which is very difficult uh, in a band to be the lead guitarist and the lead singer without having any rhythm guitar underneath it? Yeah. Uh, there's not many bands that do that. Well, I, you know, I was familiar with the setup because a lot of the bands that I listened to you know, earlier on, uh, Grand Funk was a three-piece band, and... Um, you know, and Led Zeppelin was kind of three-piece, but they weren't, uh, you know, wasn't singing and playing at the same time, but it was it was just those instruments. So uh, you had Cream, you know, Jimi Hendrix. James Gang. Yeah, James Gang. And there were a lot of bands back then that were already doing it. And it didn't it didn't seem too hard to me to do it. You know, I wasn't, I, I knew what I had to do if, if something, if I was struggling with something was just slow down, really slow everything down and know where I'm singing, when, when I'm putting in the vocal and when I'm putting in the guitar. And then that made it a lot easier. A lot of people that try to sing and play just try to do it all at once and don't think about it, you know. See, this has been a learning experience. We yeah. got rock and roll history, uh, marital and relationship advice and uh, tidbits for budding musicians. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to bring back, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the bands you covered in the early days. Um, you're recording this upcoming show at the Paramount, yes. right? Mm -hmm. okay. Is that for a, uh, a CD or a DVD or some kind of, it's, or both? It's a kind of a second documentary. Okay. You know, we did one about 20 years ago and you know it came out great but there were a lot of interviews that we didn't get to um, and there's other sides of the story you know that we didn't really touch on that uh, we're going to approach this time with the, the new one and so we wanted to have some new uh, live footage of the band also so that's that's what we're doing you know at the Paramount. Okay now you put out a live album in the 80s I think from 19. Sundance. Yeah. Okay, and I have another one that's probably unofficial from the Mad Hatter in oh, 1980. Okay. Yeah. So how, uh, you know, it struck me looking, thinking of the Mad Hatter and Sundance and places like Chevy's that when I was in high school and college, and now we've got places like the Paramount and the Long Island music scene is very different than it was how is that for you, you know, looking back at those bar days as opposed to, you know, going to a Paramount with a lot more sophisticated and cleaned yeah. up? It, does, how is that, how does that affect the performance of a band? Well, it, it makes our lives a lot easier now. When we first came up to Long Island, you know, and in New Orleans, there weren't a whole lot of clubs that had their own sound systems. They expected the bands to bring in their sound system. And you were only really going to be as good as your sound system let you be. No matter how well you played, if it didn't sound good, you know, people would go, yeah, they, they, you know, they played great, but they sounded like, you know. Uh, one great example of that was, uh, for me, was get going into the city to CBGB's, which did have a great sound system. Everybody sounded good in there. And I went and saw this, walked in, and there was, there was a three-piece band in there, and they weren't really very good, but they sounded awesome. You know, they just the sound was great, and and but we knew that, and that's why we brought up like a, a massive PA system with us from New Orleans, and we just continued on that way to make sure that we had a big sound and and covered it. And uh, I think it influenced a lot of the other bands too, because Twisted Sisters had started up in their game, and uh, yeah, it was it, the bands that were really doing well had invested in a in good PA systems, you know. Did you guys ever play CBGBs? No, no. We played at uh, we played a place down the street called the Gildersleeves, you know, which was it was known but not worldwide like CBGBs, but um, that was really the only place we played in the city. Uh, most of the gigs we did were Long Island, Jersey, you know. 
suburbia and uh you know the city was was kind of tough but th then again you know we had the P the pa system so anywhere we went we were going to be consistent sound consistently it was cool for me I, I was at the opening of the long island music and entertainment uh hall of fame when you guys opened there and they had almost everyone who was anyone of the long island music scene in the audience mm -hmm. And it was cool watching all you guys kind of reminisce about those places and seeing the artifacts that they had on display. What, you know, what are your memories from that time and what were some of your favorite places to play back then? You know, one thing that, that I remember is that the bands, all the bands were very welcoming to us, you know. Uh, they treated us really well. We opened up for a lot of the bands uh, and you know, we were getting our audience from their audience. Uh, There's a band called Essence that was more progressive. And, uh, you know, and the Twisted Sister, of course. Uh, first band we played with was Rat Race Choir. And, um, you know, we, we became great friends with all of them, even until today, you know. I, uh, I don't remember there being any band that uh, we didn't get along with. And um, so that was a good thing. And, uh, uh, you know, I do remember certain experiences. Uh, one with Twisted Sister, certainly, was the first time we'd heard about them and kind of what they were about. And they came in for sound check, but they were dressed normal. They were kind of dressed like we were, you know, seemed like normal guys. And, and then, the, you know, we did our, our first set. It was like one of these things where you play, they play, we play, they play. It was at a place called Hammerheads in Levittown, two stages. And uh, so they were going on for their first set, and D comes out of the dressing room uh, with a pink negligee. You know, that's what I thought it was. You know, it looked like a pink negligee, you know. And his girlfriend, you know, is right there primping his hair and everything, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is, you know, it really is crazy here uh and uh you know that so I, that stuck out in my mind and funny enough i i found out that that was the only time he wore that he never wore it again <laughs> believe it or not uh and uh, a friend of his kevin o'callahan who uh has been in the business for years somehow found it got that thing and had it at the music hall of fame and I saw it. I said, that's it. You know, I'm not nuts. There it is. It really was, you know. And uh, and Dee could probably still get into that. Probably. I know he yeah, takes he's in care great of shape. Yep. He's in great shape, yeah. Um, there, was another, there was a band called Salty Touch uh, that we played with that uh, had a, a bass player that dressed up in a nurse's outfit but had a uh, an enema bag on a pole and had the tube stuffed up underneath the, you know, the butt and would drag it around on stage with him, you know. And uh, so I think they were trying to out-twist Twisted, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they only lasted a couple of years, you know. And uh, That's pushing the envelope. <laughs> it really was, you know. That, that's one idea I'm not going to steal. <laughs> but it stuck, it stuck out in my mind, though, you know. I, I can only imagine... You must wake up in the middle of the night every now and then, yeah. trying to get that out of your head. Uh, it was it was uh, it was good times, you know. And uh, I actually have seen the guys. That I just ran into them for the first time in forty years the other day, and it turned out that they had played with even before that with uh, Cindy Lauper, and they they were really involved in the music scene back then, and uh, and that you know this was just one little thing they did this salty touch thing but yeah they they went for it at that point it was pretty wild okay um can't let you go without asking what's on tap for zebra in 2024 and what do you have going on randy jackson solo um zebra i've been started working out some new zebra songs with guy and we're Get, getting into the recording the process is a little different because guys living in louisiana and uh and so we're doing a lot of stuff over zoom but guy's got a great setup at his house where uh you know he can record everything set up mic'd and, and sounds great and uh, so we'll be able to knock the stuff out you know relatively quickly 
uh, and just do the arrangements, you know, over Zoom, which uh, has been working out pretty well. And uh, so we hope, you know, have something out, whether it's one song or 12 songs soon. And uh, as far as uh, solo, I, you know, I, I don't have any, like, specific plans, except I'm still playing, I'm still performing live, and that's really kind of what the solo thing's all about with me and the acoustic guitar. Uh, I still will be doing uh, shows with symphony orchestras that I've been doing for years, either Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd around the country, and uh, and enjoying my grandkids. <laughs> you, you have the symphony uh, on tap for next year? Yeah. We're doing a show in Shreveport, Louisiana in January, yeah. I don't know that there's anything scheduled yet for Long Island or, you know, but we'll see. Uh, I remember I used to go to all those shows. It was, um, you don't think about how much a symphony adds to, the shows I saw were Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And to see 50 middle-aged people at the time yeah. dressed up in tuxedos and gowns playing behind a whole lot of love, it was really, I very much enjoyed those shows. Yeah. And I was, I'm glad you reminded, you brought that up because I had that on the radar to ask you. Yeah, that's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I was in a, uh, in, throughout school, I played the baritone horn. So the environment wasn't unfamiliar to me when I started doing it. And, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun. And like you said, yeah, that the orchestra can really just yeah. lift the music off the ground, you know. Is it still a thrill getting out there, even with an acoustic guitar in front yeah, of people? I enjoy it. You know, when people enjoy it, I, I like it even more. And, uh, you know, no matter how big the audience is or how small they are, it's it's always fun. I mean, that's, that's what we, got it, we all got into it for. It was just to play. We start off playing by ourselves in our bedrooms, you know, and then, and then we get our mothers to watch. <laughs> and then from there, you bring it to your friends and see how they're going to beat you up over it. And, uh, you know, it's, but, you know, seriously, I always enjoyed it, yeah. That's probably a perfect place to end this. Thank you so much for joining me. It was uh, an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thanks, Rob. It was everything I hoped it would be when I popped that cassette into my 65 Chevy Impala Super Sport back in 1983. And uh, I hope to talk to you again. And I hope to see you again uh, on stage in the next year. Thanks. Thanks a lot.